This is Banjo, and today I'm going over the RP-22 Sapphire radar system found on the MiG-21 BIS and DCS World. The circular display is the radar scope located just in front of the stick. Over on the right, we have three switches on a black panel, which functions as the radar control panel. And above the scope, we have the radar countermeasures and auxiliary control panel. The first switch on the radar control panel controls the mode of radar operation. In the lower position, it's disabled. In the center position, it's on standby. And in the upper position, it's in operation. The red lamp above the switch indicates radar failure when illuminated. The second switch will attempt to filter out reflected ground clutter in the central position. In the upper position, the radar antenna will also be tilted up by 1.5 degrees. And as we're able to see on the scope, the ground clutter has been filtered out. The third switch on the radar control panel will enable fixed beam mode where the radar beam is fixed to bore sight and used to feed ranging information to the ASP gun sight when in manual mode in ground attack. This can be seen demonstrated in any of my air to ground tutorials for the MiG-21. With the general control panel covered, we'll move on to the display on the radar scope itself. The information displayed on the scope includes the target designator cursor, our bore sight position, ranging information for both search and track mode, degree marks for our azimuth, as well as a number of indicator lamps. The yellow horizontal dashes are the target designator cursor, which can be slewed for range using the throttle grip. As the TDC is slewed, we're able to see the range indicator on the ranging scales as moving with it. The three horizontal marks along the left side and top of the display at 10, 20, and 30 are the respective range indicators when in search mode. In search mode, targets displayed at the top are further range than targets displayed at the bottom. The 30 degrees of azimuth that the radar can scan is displayed as the vertical marks to the left and right of the 30 kilometer indicator, with marks for 10 and 20 degrees, with the edge of the screen being 30. In the center of the radar scope, we have a crosshair which indicates boresight position. To the left and right of the boresight indicator are the ranging indicators for when in track mode. The radar can undergo a bit test by pressing the self-test button on the countermeasure control panel, and a radar contact will be drawn on bore sight, allowing us to slew the TDC over the target and hold target lock, locking up the radar target. The radar enters track mode, and the target is tracked to the gimbal limits of the radar on the lower left and upper right of the display. This also displays how the radar, when in track mode, will show a chase view rather than a top-down view. As the self-test nears conclusion, the target will recenter back to bore sight, the range indicators enter the dynamic launch zone, displayed as the gap between the horizontal line and bore sight, and we're able to see the launch light indicated on the top left, followed by the brake attack light on the right. Following this, the radar lock is lost and the self-test is completed. With an air target locked, a green indicator to the left of the range scales below the ASP glass is displayed. Here we can see the radar can display many air contacts, although what we're seeing here is the way that the beam scans across a given piece of air. We can see that it takes a bit of time to complete a scan. At this point, with most of the radar display covered, we'll move in and demonstrate its use. As I'm closing in on this contact, we're able to see as he appears at the max range, just under 30 kilometers. Naturally, as the radar displays in a top-down view, he will be at the very top of the display. We're able to see as I close the range that the contact is drawn as an inverted T, and a second contact is there beside him. The direction of the vertical line extending from the horizontal line indicates altitude. So in this case, as an inverted T, these targets are at a higher altitude than I am. As the radar only has minus 1.5 degrees of elevation, this is commonly the case. At this point, we're able to see that target was at a lower altitude, and I put him on boresight and locked him up. At this point, we're able to see the gap between the horizontal line and the aircraft's icon is the dynamic launch zone. We could fire once these ranging indicators fall between it. At this point, I'll place the enemy in boresight in preparation to fire to limit the amount of maneuvering the missile has to make as it heads towards its target. As the range indicators enter the DLZ, we can see the launch light illuminates, as well as the light below it, indicating the semi-active radar missile that is selected is ready to fire. At this point, I'll continue closing the range, and we can see the range indicators enter the boresight, and the brake attack light comes on, indicating we need to brake our attack, and as I continue forward, we're able to see the radar lock is lost. As we've seen, contacts are displayed as a dash, with altitude displayed as a vertical line extending from the dash. Here we're able to see we have two friendlies and two enemies. As we can see, they're all displayed as a dash, with their altitude displayed as the vertical line extending from the dash. In order to determine friendly from hostile, we have an IFF function on the countermeasure panel, and we can see when activated, hostiles are drawn as a single dash, with friendlies drawn as a stacked dash. So at this point, after identifying the two hostile enemies, I've locked one of them up, and I'll conduct an attack. Semi-active missile employment will be demonstrated in another tutorial, either later tonight or sometime tomorrow, but to make it brief, weapons mode to air-to-air, -to -air, missile selector to semi-active radar, select the weapon station desired, get a radar lock, close the range, wait for the launch light, and fire. 
One thing to note about the IFF function is that it will not function when you're holding an active lock on a contact. Here we can see that I activate the IFF, and we can see that it is identifying friendly from foe, and we can lock them up while it's doing so, but we can't IFF when we have someone locked up. In this next example, we're able to see as I'm flying through clouds, and the clouds are reflected on the radar display, and they can actually be reflected quite heavily. To mitigate this, there's a function in which the radar will attempt to filter out the reflected clouds, located on the upper right-hand part of the countermeasure control panel. And here we're able to see, once I activate the weather function, it filters out the bulk of the reflected cloud cover. Moving on to the other functions on the countermeasure control panel, we're able to see on the second row, second from the left, there's a function for low speed target. This is a bit hit or miss, and here I'm flying at four Gamma 50s, which are traveling at about 100 kilometers an hour, and we're able to see that they don't appear on the display until I'm within several hundred meters of them. Regardless, if you're having issues trying to lock up a low speed target, enable this function as it may help. For this final example of the countermeasures control panel, as I turn into this target, we're able to see that he's running a jammer, and below the radar scope, we can see the ECM lamp is illuminated. We're able to see the contact is displayed as a series of stack contacts from the bottom of the display to the top of the display. I can still determine azimuth, but range and altitude are unknown. We have three functions on the countermeasures control panel, which can combat the various types of jamming, including passive, intermittent, and continuous. Starting with the passive jamming function, we're able to see that it does not cut through the noise jammers that those F-15s are running. So we'll move on to the intermittent function, and we're able to see as it does cut through, as does the continuous. So at this point, we're able to see the contact's altitude and range again. We're able to see when intermittent or continuous modes are activated, we no longer have control over the range the TDC is set for, as it becomes locked to about a range of 10 kilometers. The radar can remain in standby for 35 to 40 minutes, or in operation for 20 to 30 minutes before the radar needs to be turned off. The time limits for the radar are imposed by the limited amount of cooling fluid that it uses. In this example, the radar has been running for about 45 minutes, and we're able to see the ECM lamp came on at about 30, even though there's no aircraft in the air until I activated them a moment ago. We can see contacts are still drawn up on the display, and I'm still able to get a lock on them, launch and guide towards them, although I fail to strike the target. So at this point, the radar has been in operation for almost 45 minutes even, so I break my lock, lock up another target, and attempt to guide a missile towards them. We're able to see the radar fails before I get the chance. We're still able to hear the active lock being held, so I hold weapons release to fire the missile, although it just simply goes ballistic. At this point, if we glance back at the radar control panel, the radar fail light, which was not illuminated before, we're able to see in both standby and operation, is illuminated, and here we're able to see with functional radar, it is not.